Okay, so uh, let me let, let 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 us start the the second talk today, and I'm going to invite for a talk Jan Burchak from University of Leipzig, and his title is very interesting: from ketchup to con concentration driven convex integration. It's interesting. Okay, go. Okay, uh -huh. thanks. A Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm sorry that I cannot attend the whole conference, but uh, it's very early. So I have attended yesterday talks, which were the last ones, and today I have just joined. But I'm very pleased to be invited to the to the Tokyo event uh, and to Vaseda. Um, I will talk today about a, a result which is uh, uh, li related to um, my collaboration with uh, Stefano Modena and Laszlo Sekalehidi. And we will start with uh, presenting a model. This will be the catch-up part. And then I will recall some um, classical results and show our result, which is somehow dual to the classical results. It's in the convex integration non-uniqueness regime. Uh, and I will try to give you uh, ideas about proofs, only brief ideas, because I don't have much time. And also, I think it makes no sense to, to do it in, in technical details. So ideas are clear and technical details are um, sometimes heavy. If you have any questions, if you cannot see something or, or anything, please interrupt me. I don't want to somehow uh, talk in the uh, in the void. So, okay, let us start. The starting point will be uh, conservation of linear momentum uh, from continuum mechanics. Um, and uh, the observation that if you use the, let's say, modern approach to, uh, to continuum mechanics, by modern I mean uh, Truesdell, Null, and guys like this, uh, which is probably 70 years old, but it's still sometimes called modern, you use um, frame indifference um, principle to realize that your Cauchy stress tensor, which is here, this T circle, ah, sorry, um, has a quite specific form. So the Cauchy stress tensor has to depend only on um, identity matrix, symmetric part of the velocity gradient and its square uh, via scalar functions, which in turn are depending only on invariance of, of symmetric uh, velocity gradient, um, which gives uh, quite a restrictive uh, world to live in. So um, there are lots of people who are, for instance, now considering uh, um, continuum relate continuum mechanics related um, models which are actually not related directly to continuum mechanics. So I mean this first part uh, is just uh, first principles conservation of linear momentum and frame indifference which are giving us um, identity but now to model a particular fluid, we need to come up with constitutive relations. And there are lots of choices possible, not as many as some would like, but still the basic one is Euler. As we all know, then we take alpha, beta, and gamma to zero, slightly more sophisticated or slightly more, um, um, let's say, rooted in real uh, applications is the one with, with constant viscosity. This is Navier-Stokes. And if we choose uh, viscosity or the, actually the beta here to be um, slightly more um, complicated or sophisticated, for instance, this one, this is power law model of non-Newton and fluid. Um, on the other hand, if you want to have a fractional Laplace dissipation, it's not within the continuum mechanics uh, world. So there are models which have uh, this fractional dissipation in, in, uh, in, the, in the PD, and they are very good for 
numerical approximations for of flows and they should be studied but they are not modeling any flow by themselves while all of these choices do or are uh, so this is the this is the uh, the model which is the uh, conservation of linear momentum with the constitutive relation for non-Newtonian fluid. This is the third choice here. Just rewritten. Mm, we started, of course, with um, um, divergence-free and homogeneous uh, density flow at the, as, as the initial data. So I was not mentioning this, but this was our starting point when I have written the linear, uh, the conservation of linear momentum. And this PD can be understood or seen as uh, the PD for fluid with viscosity, which is changing uh, depending on how much we, we how much, how, how strong we push or how strong we shear the fluid. So viscosity changes under applied forces as, as, as is written here. And there are two principal possibilities if q this factor q is smaller than two then we have so-called shear thinning fluids otherwise there are shear thickening fluids and here we have a table of, of, of fluids which are first shear thinning uh, and our catch-up from the introduction is over here i want to draw your attention to to several facts here first of all uh, this is a table come which is coming from modeling book this modeling book over here and people are trying to fit to certain fluids or fluid like um, materials uh, cues which are in the whole range between one and infinity in particular ones which are very close to one like this peanut butter or whipped cream uh, and what is important in, in, for analysis, for our analysis later, ones which are below 1.2. 1, 1. Uh, and this will turn out to be a regime in which we cannot make much sense uh, uh, concerning well-posedness of, of, of equations. Um, this is the first point. The second is, uh, mm, in, in practice, there are much more shear thinning fluids, there are shear thickening. So the fact that, that this table is much richer on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side is not by mistake. Uh, Q smaller than two is, is, is more studied and uh, more applied. Um, and uh, I mean, concerning the, uh, uh, concerning the, maths i i mean to my knowledge the whole mathematical analysis of uh, non-newtonian fluid started uh, thanks to um uh, who has uh, devoted a small portion of her icm talk in 1966 to this power law model and i think her her hope was to somehow make a um reasonable model which is avoiding uh, non-uniqueness uh, possible non-uniqueness of, of Navier-Stokes or problems with Navier-Stokes so she was actually interested in large queues but then also before in the purely engineering community much more attention was paid to queue smaller than two um okay uh, so this is modeling. This is our this is our catch up, and now let us go to slowly to analysis. Mm. So this is again the PD repeated, just so that you 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 have it in before your eyes. Uh, it's sometimes not that easy to use slides, not chalk, but but still. And like the basic analysis starts at looking for energy and looking at scaling, right? This is true for most of PDEs. So this is energy for our non-Newtonian fluid. I have forgotten or I have uh, omitted mu naught and mu one, which were appearing here. So now mu 
not zero mu one is one but it's not very important to our results so we can cover the whole range the, the more general range than, than, than this and um, this tensor so in this case energy looks like this when i mean formal energy and um, if you can have some compactness thanks to this energy related to l2 space which is needed to make sense out of uh, the transport term then you can uh, hope for existence of energy solutions so in this range of q's q bigger than 2d over d plus 2 which is 6 over 5 uh, in three dimensions which should remind you of what you i was saying here so above this 1.2 uh one can hope for like standard um, existence of Leray hopf type solutions uh and uh, on the i mean furthermore if we look at scaling this is this is the scaling of the equation uh of this equation uh then if energy is going to infinity for at uh, at uh, small scales then you can hope that uh, uh, the linear part is somehow stronger than the non-linear part by linear i mean dissipative linear is maybe not a good choice of words and then you can hope for uniqueness so um, this behavior this energy blowing up at small scales is uh, when you do the when you do the uh computation it's q bigger than 11 over 5 in three dimensions and this rules of thumbs are are now proofs so starting from ladezhenskaya going through mm, german czech mathematicians i think also uh, with uh, jacques louis Lyons at the beginning interested in this uh in this in these models all of these um, expectations that i have um, that, that i have presented here are 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 theorems so actually for uh, q's larger than six over five you can see it here in the in the picture you have existence of larry hopf solutions and for q's larger than 11 over five which is the scaling threshold you have uniqueness of energy solutions. Okay, so this looks like a complete picture. And now our uh, contribu contribution is the, is the dual picture, somehow dual picture. So um, we were able to show that below this compactness threshold, you can see again the picture with, with, with dual uh, shaded regions. Yes, compared to the previous picture. So for for queues, these queues smaller than six over five, you have we can show um, non uniqueness of solutions in the in this class. In particular, we can prescribe the whole not only kinetic part of the energy but the whole energy to behave as we want. Uh, of course, this is below compactness, so you cannot test with solution or with with mollified solution and make sense out of it. We do something else. But um, I mean, I started to to work on this problem when I realized that there is this um, uh, important paper by Buckmaster and Bicol in which they are uh, showing non uniqueness for very weak solutions. To Navier Stokes. And the only problem there is that they are not Leray Hopf solutions. They are just solutions which are mm, having weird kinetic energies. Mm, so I tried to do something in between, and this is the, or we tried to do something in between, and this is the result. So we have uh, lower Qs than in the Navier Stokes case, Q equals two. But for these lower queues, queues we can have total energy um, behaving wildly. Uh, moreover, uh, for queues between one and eleven over five, which, which catches up 
the, the Navier Stokes case, we have extension of Buckmaster Ruby Color results, which is saying that we have non unique solutions and let's say some very weak class, class of very weak solutions with some extra regularity such that we can control the kinetic part of the energy. And furthermore, in the same range of Qs between one and 11 over five, this is result in any dimensions, but I'm, I'm talking about 3D uh, and, and the statement is in, in any. Um, then if we, if we drop the, um, let's say, ambition to prescribe energy at all, if we allow uh, energy to, to um, pathologically rise at the initial time, more or less, then we can create pathological solutions for any L2 initial data. So the previous points A and B are showing, uh, are, are giving some initial data which are uh, which are giving rise to non uniqueness of non unique solutions, and the last point is is saying that for n initial datum we can create weirdly behaving solutions in a very weak class, and this is as I said at the beginning a, a joint uh, paper with Stefano Modena and Laszlo Sekalehidi, which which has uh, appeared a month ago in press uh, okay so this is the result and now let me go to the methods so if you have any questions concerning the the result or the initial part i'm happy to stop here and 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 uh, answer them yeah may i ask you a question how do sure. you understand the solution what is your solution what what, what is this my solution is a very weak solution. Uh, so my solution is a uh, very weak solution of this guy. So I'm putting, uh, uh, so yes, I'm putting time derivative of a test function, divergence or gradient on the test function and this divergence of, on the test function. Okay, may I have a question? Sure. Uh, so this is good slide. So this new zero is zero in your case, and this is different from zero. It can be both. Ah, can be both. Okay, thanks. Uh, the issue is that this Q uh, cannot be inside because then you would have L2, LQ dissipation, right? Yes, so it means that can, can, cannot cannot hit uh, modulus here, but it has to be related to really LQ energies. Oh, okay, so there is right? something so if, with this new zero, yes. Yes, if you have new zero strictly Positive? bigger than zero, strictly bigger than zero, then it's really important that this Q minus two is outside of bracket and not inside of bracket, because otherwise you would have this. Let's say one dv okay, yes. and dv giving you l two l two. I understand. I understand. So this is the question that we need to be below l two. Yes. Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, okay. But there, I mean, coming back to Gregory's question, there is no cheating in the in the energy at all. So uh, we are defining weak solution to. Uh, to this object, and we are, which is this, or even less, is CL2, LQ, W1, Q. This is enough for weak solutions, and we are uh, dissipating the whole energy, which is this guy. This is the, let's say, the Ray Hopf energy. Okay, if there are no more questions, let me go slowly to the methods. So, and let me start with this story. So the convex integration story started with, uh, in 1950s with the results, which are purely geometric. Um, and uh, with the results of Nash and then Kuiper concerning 
flexibility of isometric embeddings, which are somehow a quantitative version of corrugations and topology introduced by Thurston. I will mention this part later in more detail. Then these ideas were uh, somehow put into more abstract ge geometrical uh, setting by Gromov, which was, uh, uh, and he, he, he coined the, uh, the name H principle, which is related to, I mean, this H is homotopy, but it's understood as, as flexibility principle. And there is a book of, of Gromov from 1986, I think, Partial Differential Relations, in which he, he develops this theory. Um, and then people started to realize, I mean, I think that, as I understood, uh, there was a feeling that uh, this, this book and these ideas are somehow not appreciated for, for several, several years or even decades. Um, and then people started to use these ideas to produce something related to non-uniqueness or counterexamples in, for regularity in, in PDs related to continuum mechanics. So I think that the starting point was the, uh, was the work by Müller uh, and, and Schwerak uh, concerning counterexamples in, in calculus of variations which were related to elasticity theory. And then um, there is a series of important results by Camillo de Lalis and Laszlo Sakalehidi, who introduced convex integration into fluid dynamics uh, in order to, to resolve the Omsager conjecture, so for Euler and in C alpha setting. Um, so there is, there is, of course, very rich story, which I'm not mentioning here. Parts of this story, parts of, of this story is, is purely geometric um, setting developed by, for instance, Bernd Kirchheim, uh, quite amazing one. And also there is a story related to Euler, but what was interesting to me, since I'm, I'm, I'm coming from dissipative community, was what happened next. So actually, the next part that I want to mention is, is this paper by Buckmaster and Bicol, which uh, considered very weak solutions to nether stokes And they were able to show non-uniqueness for these very weak solutions, which is this result B for Q equals two in worse uh, spaces. So they have only CL2 and some sense of, uh, of gradient in L1, actually of curl only in L1, which mm, allows them to, to define the solution and to, uh, to push through the, the, the method. Uh, but I mean, I think at the beginning, I was not appreciating this on the technical level too much. So I thought that this is like fake and this uh, another Stokes solution, which needs that, I mean, which is probably um, too general or too fake to, to have good properties. So no wonder that, that it's not unique. But then when you start to dig into the methodology, step from Euler to another Stokes is, is a really nice job uh, in the sense that uh, the Euler is restricted to, um, we'll see it later, to derivatives which are no bigger than one over three. This is the Onsager conjecture. And these de derivatives uh, can live in, um, in, in, space, in, in, in spaces based on, on continuous functions. But if you want to do navier Stokes with these methods, you need to have at least full derivative in, in L1 or almost full derivative in L1. Um, and it's a big difference. So the, 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 the step from C alpha or from fractional derivatives to full derivatives was done by Buckmaster and Bicol using 
what they called intermittency. We'll see soon what what can it, how it can be easily explained. I, I think that it's already in the title. I called the this talk. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a name: concentration-driven uh, convex integration, and and intermittency is simply concentration. We'll see it soon. Concentration of functions. They did it on the Fourier side, and then there is a mm, there is a group of works, two papers by Stefano Modena, Laszlo Sekelehidi, and these two guys with Gabriel Satik, uh, in which they mm, translated the ideas of Buckmaster and Vicol, uh, first of all to the transport equation, which is a much simpler setting, but I think most importantly they made uh, a much cleaner sense out of in, out of intermittency. Uh, so from messy Fourier side computations, they obtained a very clear real side picture of of, of very concentrated concentrated function. And then the the, the, the the paper that I mean the results that I'm talking now about is taking all these ideas, working a little bit, and going back to fluid dynamics with better result so this is the story and uh, let me mention two parts of this story in more detail the first will be the first part which is this nash kuiper theory and the second part will be our paper so uh, i think i still have like 20 minutes it's a good timing so again please interrupt me Anytime you want, and uh, now we are at the very beginning of of uh, convex integration, which is Nash Kuiper um, theorem and H principle. So this is maybe a little bit too heavy. What's written here? We have just uh, notation M is smooth compact manifold with some metric G. U is um, function from this manifold into R capital N, and it's called isometric immersion, if it conserves lengths of curves, which is, in other words, with, uh, written here. So if, if this PD or this identity holds, and U is short, if this identity is relaxed to inequality, it is strictly it is strictly short if, uh, as you can guess, this inequality is a strict inequality. And now the theorem of Nash, then improved by Kuiper, is saying that uh, if we have uh, n bigger equal n plus one, uh, then any sorry, it's lunchtime in Germany, so. Uh, it's, uh, then uh, any smooth short immersion can be approximated by isometric immersions. I, I think I have a picture, yes, picture is here. So please imagine them. Uh, uh, this is Nash Kuiper in, in one dimension, this picture. It's, it's just a picture. So please imagine uh, uh, S1, a circle which is shrinking which is shrunk, and this shrinking is our uh, short immersion. So it's shrinking lengths of curves from a circle to a very small circle. And then the question is how to approximate this, uh, mm, uh, this U with isometric immersions, with the, with the guys that are conserving lengths. And the simple idea, which is pictured here, I think the picture is a little bit too small, is just to add lots of twiddles uh, so that the, the the lengths are much larger than the perimeter of the uh, of the of the shrunk sphere and in in the topological language without any uh, quantitative results these are corrugations by thurston that are very good looking pictures on the web by Vincent Borelli about these corrugations. And if you make it, uh, make it uh, uh, quantitative, uh, then it's um, 
spirals of convex integration. Uh, so I will mention this proof of this theorem very shortly soon. So we'll be back at spirals in a second, but I just want to make a few comments before that. So first of all, uh, if you look at the if you look at the uh, PD, we have n un n unknowns, capital n unknowns, and uh, since we have symmetric uh, matrix here, this number of equations, so it looks very bad in the sense of having uh, um, lots of uh, isometric immersions which could uh, uh, approximate uh, short immersions. So the, the, the system is, it looks very rigid, it's overdetermined. But actually here, the non-rigidity, the, the fact that we can have uh, uh, these approximations comes from low regularity. So by low regularity here, what I mean is C1. And for instance, uh, this result is not true for C2. There is the second, let's say, uh, part of, 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 of theory, which is called, which is related to rigidity. And I think that the main name there is Borisov. And people are trying to lower this C2 as much as possible uh, in the rigidity, so in, in this statement. Uh, on the other hand here, you can think about going with this as high as possible. And I think Gromov's suggestion was this being C1, one half. So just in the middle. And the last, uh, the last uh, bullet here, the last remark is that this procedure produces in particular lots of isometric immersion. So around each short immersion, which is just relaxation. So there are, there, there is extremely many of, of short immersions. You can find an isometric immersion. And this is the, this is the main, let's say, mechanism that is uh, pushing non-uniqueness and uh, what happens next. All of this is, is called, as I said, H principle. So if we have a flexible system, for instance, low regularity system, there is some other, there are some other theories for underdetermined systems. Um, then we can have uh, solutions to the system, to the guy with equality, uh, which are very close to the uh, solutions of the relaxed system, which is here in the guy with strict inequality, the short immersion. And the main idea of the proof is, is very simple. So uh, let us start somewhere. Uh, let us start with U. And let us, and this U is, uh, uh, is our short immersion now. And we want to correct this U so that it is uh, uh, becoming uh, as close as we want to the uh, isometric immersion. So let us define new U, which is this old U, new U, which is, which is U1, plus some fast oscillating guy in a direction zeta. It's not that important uh, for us, for, for this level of explanation. Then we see that the uh, gradient of U1 is gradient of U plus uh, the case when derivative hits the fast variable, which is A times gradient of F psi, because now this lambda is killing this lambda minus one plus some lower order term because all the rest is having this lambda minus one in the front of, in front of them. As a result, uh, if we can choose F correctly, we have the new U1, which is the previous short immersion plus some correction plus a small uh, small error. And now these corrections are forming up 
the corrections, which is related to the gap between our metric and the short immersion. So if we, if we want to fill in this gap, thus receiving a isometric uh, immersion, and filling this gap means if you look here, uh, means just choosing um, all the directions that we should choose and defining A correctly so that we have this identity. Um, and uh, if you look at, at the formulas, you see immediately that the, diff, the, the, the C1 bound for the difference between the old guy, which is the uh, which is the short immersion and the new guy, which is almost, uh, which is almost uh, immersion. I mean, the guy with identity, sorry, um, is just related to this A and lower order factor. It's, it's this identity written here. So if we don't choose F too stupidly, we see that uh, this difference is controlled by a plus some lower order factor, which is controlled, as you can see here, by square root of this object. So here is a squared, because the whole nonlinearity non is quadratic, and as a result, here is half plus uh, low higher order term. So as a result, we have moved from a short immersion, which had this gap, to U1 which is almost uh, immersion with equality. Mm, and to fill in this gap, we are repeating this process. So this is iterative process, uh, which, which in the limit gives us the result of the theorem. And the same idea is uh, then transferred to, um, to fluid dynamics. So this was the starting point, which was created in the head of MASH. And now let us see how it's uh, being transferred to, to fluid dynamics. So the general idea, let's, let's have a stopover at, 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 at Gromov's H principle, but already somehow tailored to fluid dynamics is to take a PD, to relax it to PD relation. So this PD is, is immersion. This is or equivalent of immersion. This is equivalent to a short, a short immersion. And this R, which is error between these two, is uh, in the previous language, in the language from the previous sli slide, this difference that we were filling in. Next, let us correct solutions to this uh, mm, PDR with something which is fast oscillating to reduce the error. And if the system is flexible enough, uh, we can produce as a result of, of this iterative process solution of PDE such that it is close to the relaxed problem. And this proximity to the relaxed problem, because there are lots of relaxed problems, gives us non uniqueness. So there are many PDRs, and as a result, there are many solutions to PDE. Uh, this is the fluid dynamics uh, rewriting of this concept. So let us take our PDE, which is our non-Newtonian flow. This A is the um, shorthand for this du q minus 2 du. Let us first average it. And this is a little bit vague, but um, let's say that bar is some averaging process which can be related to ergodicity or whatever. I think it's not important for our talk. And the average uh, velocity field will be understood as a laminar flow, as a, as a coarse grain flow. And uh, if we average, we cannot commute with nonlinearity, so we are producing, producing an error. And this will be our PDR. So we call this whole guy error or divergence of error. And if you want the fluid dynamics uh, interpretation, it can be 
seen as a Reynolds stress. So deviation between turbulent flow and, and laminar flow. Uh, and now this guy with R is our PDR that we want to uh, that we want to work with uh, and iteratively to diminish this R while still staying in the let's say convex hull, which is uh, which is giving us non unique. Uh, so this is um, this is then our starting point. So this let's say that we have U not Q not and R not, which is a initial triple of uh, of non-Newtonian Reynolds system, which is this relaxed system. And our aim is again to produce a new solution, U1, as, as you saw from the Nash Kuiper um, world, so that such that uh, we are removing this error as much as possible uh, via fast oscillations. So U1, uh, is u not plus some corrector. Please compare it was it's identical as before. It was u not plus some corrector. Uh, and this corrector is related to our error times, this is our error, square root is a little bit informal. Uh, but yes, I mean, let's, let's keep it. Um, times some fast oscillating function. And now um, the new error will be related to uh, up cross up minus r plus some other errors that I don't want to mention. It's, this is just an idea, not a proof. Uh, so we can hope that if we look here, so there will be up times up uh, plus some cross term that we are not discussing now minus r in this in this u one, um, and they are all under divergence, and the error itself is uh, inverse divergence of this whole object. And of course, this looks like a very ridiculous thing to do because nothing is, is changing. But uh, as you remember before, there was a difference between uh, um, derivatives hitting slow variables and fast variables. And this is precisely what we want to achieve here. So if this divergence hits fast variables because of special W that we are choosing, actually these Ws are solutions to stationary Euler flows or some uh, solutions to, uh, to simple fluid dynamics problems, then if this divergence is hitting the fast variables, everything is vanishing. So then this part is zero. So the only contribution is when uh, to R1 is when this divergence is hitting slow variables, which in this case is just R0. And as a result, this outer inverse divergence is buying us fast variable uh, in one over, one over lambda. So this is buying us the smallness that we saw, that we saw here. And this is a basic idea transferred to, to fluid, fluid dynamics. And now the whole game is to produce or main in ingredient of the game, maybe not the whole game, is to produce WQ, which is good enough. So we saw that in order to uh, not to do something extremely stupid here, we need this WQ vanish under action of, of divergence minus R0. In particular, if it's close to fluid dynamics, uh, solutions is good and actually, these properties are good enough. You see that if we uh, produce WQ, which is behaving like this, then the fast, uh, the fast variable is, is vanishing. 
So these are, for instance, called Mikado flows, depends on the construction or previously. Mm, one used Beltrami flows. There are different uh, ansatzes, an ansatze, ansatzes, I think it should be in English, German, uh, to, to work in particular uh, settings. And I want to draw your attention only to one, one particular issue, which is this concentration. So let's say we have this ansatz for W, which is giving us uh, fast oscillating uh, functions and correctors uh, with lambda minus one in front of uh, uh, in front of the remainder, which is nice. But uh, if we want high derivatives, we are in trouble. So it's absolutely not um, immediate to see. But actually, if all LP norms of our W are behaving in the same way, so you can start thinking about. Um, this corrector before and this corrector now as bait based on, on a plane wave, on, on sine. Uh, and so then every LP of, of, of sine or of, of a plane wave is the same or is, um, is, is similar to each other in magnitude. Uh, and as a result, uh, there is a threshold 1 over 3 for differentiability for such uh, w, Ws used as a um, as a building block of our convex integration ansatz, but we want higher higher uh, differentiability, and this intermittency idea transferred into concentration idea is to somehow buy derivatives with low integrability. So before we are we 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 were living in C alpha world, so let's say W13 infinity. And now we hope to raise uh, differentiability at the cost of in decreasing uh, integrability. And the idea behind this is to concentrate the function. So let us look at first at the, at the one dimension um, and take a function which is called f, yeah, okay, no. yes, and then let us concentrate it into a peak. Uh, as a result, we are producing function f mu, which is having very differently behaving L, mm, LLP or LQ norms. So they are not the same as in the case of waves, they are behaving like this with this mu being a concentration factor. Then we can make this function uh, periodic. And uh, it's retaining its scaling from the, from the real line. And if we make it fast oscillating, this is this lambda here, and these fast oscillations are, uh, are needed in the process, as you remember then derivatives of this function are behaving like this. And uh, you can see here in the picture uh, that this, these functions are very steep and they are actually, if you look at the periodized picture, they are zero most of the time. So, so the length or the support of, of, uh, of the section where, where it's vanishing, it's, it's large. And you can play the same game in many dimensions, uh, thus producing concentrated Mikado flows. So in many dimensions, the, uh, the factor here, is, of course, is, is, is changing. We want to keep L2 unchanged uh, because we have quadratic nonlinearity, very briefly speaking. But it's yes. So if we keep L, if we if we keep uh, everything normalized at L2. This is the concentration in many dimensions. And as a result, this is the behavior of the function, which is our concentrated Mikado, which is based on this F mu. It's not precisely F mu. And um, it is, as you can see here, for low derivative, for low integrability, 
uh, having this factor mu in negative power. So if you forget about concentration, if you work with usual Mikados, then you have derivatives of Mikados or derivatives of these guys which are building blocks behaving like lambda times something. And this lambda times something is, is too large to, uh, to be dealt with uh, within the iterations. While now, if you look what's happening here, we have lambda times uh, remainder of the um, uh, concentration factor, which is uh, going to zero as this power, this power approaches 2d over d plus 2, which is 6 over 5. This is the reason why, uh, why we have the result under 6 over 5. Uh, and this all allows us to prove uh, one step of it, I mean, to prove proposition, which is one step of iteration of our convex integration scheme, which says, uh, I'm about to finish, I think I've got three minutes uh, left, right? Or five? Oh, minus one. <laughs> okay, sorry. So uh, this is the. Uh, this is the iterative proposition. I will not get into details, but we are just uh, uh, showing that we can make the new triple um, as close as we want to uh, the solution of PDE. So, meaning that reducing this error are not as much as we want. We need to iterate this, but uh, not as carefully as in the usual con convex integration schemes. And this is my last slide, which is a summary, saying that we have non-uniqueness, uh, which is uh, somehow a dual picture to the usual existence uh, results. And uh, it's quite clean methodology, avoiding Fourier side. I think that's all. Yes, thanks a lot for your attention and sorry for going over time. Right. Thank you very much for your nice talk. And now we are going to discuss your uh, your results. Any question to, to Jan? Right. Jan, uh, may I ask you a question? So sure. you, you, you probably know the list of uh, existence results for non-Newtonian fluids. That's a lot of in Czech school yes. uh, and uh, Ruzicka in German school. So plenty of them. And my question is, uh, do you have a counterexample to them? At least one. To them? Uh, to, 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 to this uh, uh, existence, known existence no, result? No, I mean, this is, this is, this is uh, exactly opposite regime. So all the results that they have is having uh, existence above this 2D D plus 2 if you translate it into the power law uh, case, because I mean, Ruzicka is doing electro-rheological, some people in, in Czech school are doing like maximal monotone graphs. So it's not always translatable easily to, to simple power law model. But no, I, uh, this, is, uh, this is something which are trying now. So we are now trying to push this 2D over D plus two, to the right, but not yeah, think, yet. Yeah, but you know the the aim of this uh, is like uh, to show that you you have non uniqueness, uh, but for what? If you if you if you intuitively clear, if you if you allow solution to be too weak, then then the chances sure, of sure, sure. Uh, this is are quite high. Of course, maybe it's difficult to understand, but what is the you you, you refer to fluid mechanics, for example, to this law mm -hmm. and so on. But in fluid mechanics also there is an 
kind of notion of what does it mean a solution? It's kind of principle yes, sure. of virtual uh, displacement and so on. So if you if you well, it's just uh, just. Yeah, I understand. I mean, that's that's why I started with the. I will go very back. That's why I started here. So my point at the beginning was that there are people who are claiming that weak solutions to this system are good models for some very exotic materials, like here. And we are saying that if this Q is smaller than one over two, there are solutions which are weak solutions with energy inequality make no sense because they are non-unique. So from the perspective of modeling, there is some, I think, merit. But from the perspective of analysis, I agree with you that, well, you cannot test, you don't have compactness, so you expect something bad going on, absolutely. Okay, any other question to, to Jan? If not, yeah, thank you very much for your nice talk and that's it for today. Okay, thanks a lot.